Okay, kids, Charlie Buso here. This is the very end, the last two pages of the notes. We'll do them all in one shot. We're going to start with number 92. All of the bonding we've done before, ionic, covalent, and metallic, those are all really strong bonds in chemistry. Ionic being the strongest, covalent, very strong. I mean, not quite as strong as ionic, but not in any way a slouch. Metallic bonds holds metals together, right? And I joke about my keys. I've had the same keys for 20 years almost. Those keys still open the locks because the metals hold together in a really tight, strong way. The bonds we're going to talk about now are called intermolecular. Intermolecular means in between molecules or actually in between particles because sometimes we can have molecules and atoms or even atoms and atoms. Well, we still call it intermolecular. And what that means is between the particles. Relatively speaking, these are very weak, okay, compared to metallic, covalent, and ionic bonds, okay? And they're really important, and actually, they're really cool. It'd be helpful if you had your, your periodic table, because we're going to want to put our fingers in some of these boxes as we go. So, ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals. The metals lose their electrons, and our metals gain. Actually, that means they transfer electrons, and they make what are called neutral ionic compounds. They're neutral because the electron transfer is perfect, and whatever the charges of the positive cations are, they have to balance with the negative anions. And like with sodium chloride, positive one, negative one, no problem. Magnesium oxide, positive two, negative two, no problem. But with this one, copper Roman numeral two chloride, we have a positive two and a negative one anion. Positive two and negative one don't balance in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we have to have a formula that's not one-to-one. -one. In this case, it's gonna be one-to-two. The positive two copper ion bonds with two negative one chloride anions. But ionic bonds, metals and nonmetals, transfer of electrons. Now in a covalent bond, Covalent bonds are when two or more non-metals share their electrons. There's no, no metals and no ions ever. Now, the molecules that form are going to either have a single, double, or triple bond. That means they're going to share one pair of electrons, or they're going to share two pairs of electrons, or they're going to share three pairs of electrons. The covalent bonds can be what's called polar or nonpolar, depends on if they share those electrons evenly. And we measure that with the electronegativity difference. Every atom has an electronegativity value on table S. And if they're the same numbers, like in O2, O2, both atoms of oxygen have a 3.4 electronegativity. The difference between 3.4 and 3.4 is zero. When there's no difference in electronegativity, that means it's a nonpolar bond. But whenever there is a difference, say with water, H2O, the bond between hydrogen and oxygen is polar because oxygen has a 3.4 electronegativity and hydrogen has a 2.2. The difference is 1.2. That's pretty big. The, whole, the highest number is four goes from zero to four, if there's a difference of 1.2, that's pretty polar. And you can rank bond polarity by comparing the, the electronegativity differences. Most of these atoms follow the octet rule. And the ions do also. Ions, metals lose enough electrons to be isoelectric to a noble gas, and the nonmetals gain electrons to be isoelectric to a noble gas. For the nonmetal covalent bonding, they share enough electrons to get to the uh, magic number, in a sense, eight. There are some exceptions, though, for the very small numbers. Metallic bonds keep hunks of metals together, right? They're not really bonds, in a sense, but the way we explain it is the metals are packed cations surrounded by their loose valence electrons, loose and mobile uh, valence electrons. And that helps explain all the important properties of metals. Now, these bonds basically are all inside the compound or inside this hunk of metal. What we're about to talk about are called intermolecular bonds, which are between the particles that are actually not stuck together usually. There's three kinds, weak, weak, and weaker. All right, we're going to start with the weakest, I believe. These are all much weaker, though, than the regular compounds. Weakest to strongest is called electron dispersion force. Electrons get dispersed in an electron orbital cloud. 
Then there's something called dipole interaction, two poles, positive and negative. And then there's something called hydrogen bonding. So there are three kinds of intermolecular attraction. Every single atom and every single molecule has some electron dispersion force. It's really weak compared to everything, but it's important. It makes a difference sometimes too. Dipole interaction is when you have polar bonds with polar molecules, right? You gotta have polar bonds with polar molecules. And then finally, hydrogen bonding, which is like super duper dipole. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Now, the weakest, it's caused by the constant movement of electrons in atoms or compounds. Sometimes electron dispersion attraction, it's not really a bond. It's, it's a force, it's an attraction. It's not really a force either. It's more of an attraction, but it's called electron dispersion force. When the electrons are moving around at any one moment, sometimes they're a little bit more on one side than the other. Let's see what we got going on here. Here's our example of fluorine. Every atom of fluorine has nine total electrons. So F2 has 18 electrons altogether. And it makes a single nonpolar covalent bond. They both have seven valence orbitals. They both share one back and forth. So the F2 molecule has a total of 18 electrons. And they literally are all moving around. They're not in little rings going around like the planets that stay very orderly. They are kind of wacko. Electrons are like teenagers. They kind of do whatever the heck they want. So if I were to actually draw a little on this um, to help you see this, uh, I think I'm going to draw with this, and I think I'm going to draw in red. Right here, there seems to be no electrons. And right here, there seems to be no electrons. So this part of the orbital is going to be slightly positive because there's no electrons. Now, it's kind of negative over here, and it's kind of negative in here. So different places in each molecule are gonna be slightly positive. This is gonna be a little bit positive here, and this may be a little positive here, and a little positive here, but it's gonna be more negative in here, and more negative here. Now what happens is, here's another fairly large positive zone, and it's kind of negative in the middle, and then it's positive again on the outside. At any moment, in any molecule, for moments, we're talking nanoseconds, the electrons are zooming all around. But moment to moment, there is motion of electrons. And so what it does is it creates in the electron orbitals momentary positive and negative moments in the electron orbital cloud. And so what would happen is if we actually uh, thought about it, let me pick a different color so you can see. I'm gonna go with blue now. This little positive area and this little negative area are gonna be slightly attracted together, slightly. This negative area is gonna be slightly attracted to that positive. This positive will be slightly attracted to that negative. Uh, this positive might be slightly attracted to that negative for a nanosecond. And then the electrons move and then at any, at any nanosecond, there's different positive and negative moments, we call them, on the electron orbital cloud. And that creates a certain positive negative intermolecular attraction. Now this moment to moment attraction with the motion of all of these 18 electrons is a legitimate attraction. It's real, it's measurable, right? But it's not such a big deal. It makes the molecules slightly attracted to each other. It's not zero. But if we were to consider uh, fluorine at standard temperature and pressure, at standard temperature and pressure at 273 Kelvin and normal pressure, fluorine is a gas. This attraction doesn't seem to have much, doesn't seem to have much effect. It's not zero, but fluorine, which is in group 17, is a gas. So now if we look at the next slide, the next molecule in group 17 is chlorine. Each chlorine has 17 electrons and a Cl2 molecule has 34 electrons. 34 electrons is a lot more than 18 in fluorine. 
And so because each of these molecules has more electrons that are all moving, they're all dispersed, and at any one moment, they'll be dispersed a little to the left or a little to the right, or a little up or down. At any moment, there's going to be a slight positive and negative moment where these molecules might be a little bit attracted together. For instance, I'm just going to draw a little again. Let me get my pen here. This might be slightly negative and this might be slightly positive. So there's going to be a slight attraction. Nanosecond, now it's over. Um, right here, it might be slightly positive and here is going to be negative and there's going to be a slight attraction there. Here it looks a little positive and there's negative over here, right here. So there'll be a slight attraction here. We're talking for a nanosecond because these electrons are moving pretty fast. Because there are more electrons in Cl2, there's 34 electrons compared to fluorine, these moments of attraction are a little stronger. There's a little bit more attraction moment to moment based upon where the electrons are dispersed in the molecule for that nanosecond, okay? But at STP, at STP, chlorine's a gas. There's an attraction, eh, it doesn't really make a difference, right? It's kind of like, I don't know, you, you're shopping and you're just shopping and you're shopping, and you're looking at rings and earrings and bracelets. So you see something like, oh, that's nice. And you keep going, you don't actually stop to try it on. You noticed it. It was real, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of difference. This attraction, electron dispersion is real, but it doesn't seem to make any difference here. And it, it doesn't really make a difference. It's literally not a zero difference, but we'll not notice it. Now, when we get to bromine, which is the third element in the halogens, bromine each has 35 electrons and Br2 has 70 electrons. 70 electrons is a lot more, a lot more. And as these electrons move around or disperse in any moment, we'll create, what, I guess, even a dipole. In, in the electron cloud, there'll be positive areas and negative areas, this temporary dipole, this, this moment of positive and negative in the cloud. But because there's so many more electrons, the negative is a little bit more negative than before, and the positive is a little more positive than before, this weak weak attraction that's constantly changing and constantly present is in fact strong enough to make bromine a liquid at STP. So we have diatomic fluorine, diatomic chlorine, and now diatomic bromine. Gas, gas, and uh oh, this one's a liquid. How come it's a liquid? Literally, because this electron dispersion force, which is not very strong, is now, because there's so many electrons, strong enough to make a little bit of a difference. Bromine is still a neutral, uh, a neutral molecule. It's got a nonpolar bond. It's just the two atoms. But because literally just of the movement of the electrons, there's an attraction between the particles. STP, it's a liquid. And then finally, I can't even draw it right, iodine has 53 electrons and I2 is 106 electrons. And these electrons are moving so much that at any moment, for a nanosecond, there's a much stronger negative or positive moment in the electron orbital cloud that creates a much stronger attraction. It's still weak. It's still weak. But now it's enough to make these iodine molecules stick together. How come iodine is a solid? Because it has stronger electron dispersion forces. Why? Because there's so many more electrons. And at any moment, they're all shifted left or shifted right, and then there's going to be moments of negative and positive in the electron orbital cloud of this molecule. And it's enough to make them stick together. Now, there's times when the electrons are kind of more balanced, and it's, yeah, it's almost zero, this positive, it's balanced, this, this more neutral molecule. But there's enough electrons in enough molecules there's enough moments of positive and negative that iodine actually sticks together. So in one group, group, group 17, two molecules are gases at STP. Bromine is a liquid at STP and iodine is a solid. We have four diatomic nonpolar molecules. Two are gases, one's a liquid, one's a solid, all because 
of what's called the electron dispersion force. The more electrons you have, the greater it is. So even though it's the weakest of all the forces of intermolecular attraction, it makes a difference. If there's enough electrons, you could be a solid. If there's not quite enough electrons, you could be a liquid still. And if there's not too many electrons, it's not a zero attraction, but it doesn't seem to have much effect. Pretty cool. Now, I just said that. We got gases, liquids, and solids. The difference is only due to the amount of electro intermolecular attraction caused by the electron dispersion force. I just said that. I forgot that the slide was coming and I talked. Okay, I love this font at the top. This is old school Charlie Abuso. I can't even make this font anymore, but I've saved it in the slideshow because I really like that. It's really cool looking with the shadow. All right, electron dispersion is caused by the motion of electrons. The electrons are constantly moving. The dipole attraction is different. When two atoms bond together and there's a difference in electronegativity value, the bonds become polar. One side is mostly negative, that gets the electron. They have the higher electronegativity, they pull harder, they get the electron. And one side is more positive because they lose their electron. Now, if we have polar bonds and they happen to be in a polar molecule, the molecule shape itself doesn't balance out that attraction, positive, negative, that it's balanced. If we have a polar bond with a polar molecule, that's going to make the molecules polar most of the time. And since one side's negative and one side's positive, we call that dipole. A dipole attraction is when polar bonds and polar molecules create an almost constant positive-negative side to the molecule. And that positive and negative sides to the molecules will cause the molecules to attract together. For instance, we have to draw dipole arrows. Let me get my pen out here because I got to draw them. Now, if we look up the electronegativity value of chlorine, which I'm doing right now because I'm modeling good behavior, it is 3.2. And for sulfur, which is element 16, it's only 2.6. So if we were to draw the dipole arrows, the sulfur would be losing its electrons to chlorine and the sulfur side of the bond becomes positive. And the same would happen on this side. The chlorine would pull the electrons harder and the sulfur would become more positive. On this molecule, on this molecule, carbon in the middle has a 2.6. And I'm not gonna write all of these, but each of the hydrogens is 2.2. That means the hydrogens are gonna lose the battle and all of the dipole arrows will point inwards. The hydrogens are gonna to tend to lose their electrons to carbon most of the time because carbon has a much stronger electronegativity value. It's gonna pull on those electrons much more. And so all of these arrows face inward. So let's talk about this a bit. Sulfur dichloride, has two bonds that are polar. And this molecule is not really balanced because sulfur has the eight electrons. There's gonna be two here. There's gonna be two here. It's gonna have one here and one here. This bond means that chlorine is sharing an electron. So the sulfur, which has six red dots, is gonna borrow two dots from chlorine. Each of the chlorines has uh, seven dots, three, four, five, six, and it's gonna borrow back. Now it's got a little too many dots to show, but there's, there's gonna be eight here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the one that's on this side that it pulls back from sulfur. So the chlorines are gonna end up with eight dots also. The dots plus that bar. So they both end up, but chlorine is gonna pull harder. And so sulfur is gonna end up becoming the more positive side of this molecule and the chlorines are gonna become more negative. Now there's something called bond polarity, which is obvious here. 
there's also something called molecular polarity. And molecular polarity has got to do with something called radial symmetry. Radial symmetry is the symmetry that say a pizza pie has. If you put a dot in the center and you cut through any direction through the center point, you always get two equal sides. Now, if I were to try to cut this molecule of sulfur dichloride in half, if I were to use my ninja sword that was really small and I could do this, if I cut this in half this way, on the left, I would have a chlorine, half a sulfur, and two unshared pairs of electrons. And on the right, I would have the same. I would have a chlorine, half a sulfur, and two pairs, uh, another pair of unshared electrons. So it seems like it's got some symmetry there. But if I cut it in half this way, on the bottom I have two chlorines, and on the top I have two pairs of electrons. This is not exhibiting radial symmetry. This molecule is polar. This is a polar molecule because the positive and negative of the bonds is not balanced. We have polar bonds, but the molecule is polar also. So if you had a whole bunch of sulfur dichlorides together, all the positive sulfur sides would be attracted to all the chlorines on the other sides of other molecules, and all the chlorines would be attracted to all the sulfurs. That attraction has two poles, the positive and negative. Oh, there's a dipole. Let's look at methane before we go further. Methane has four polar bonds. Carbon pulls the electrons in more, so the bonds are polar, the hydrogen sides are all more positive, and the center of the molecule, okay, the molecule looks kind of like this, right? This is different colors, but the carbon in the middle and green on the outside, but it could represent CH4. In this shape, all the negative is pulled to the center and all the positive is on the outside. If I were to cut this in half this way, I get two equal pieces. I didn't cut that too straight with my, my, my mouse here, but that I have half a carbon and two hydrogens on both sides. If I cut it a little neater this way, I have half a carbon and two hydrogens on either side. If I cut it this way, I have half a carbon a hydrogen and two half hydrogens on the top and bottom. And if I go down to the middle this way, I didn't cut that too neat either. This is like a pizza pie, right? Not a good pizza pie, but no matter where I cut it, it's equal and balanced. So we have polar bonds, but the molecule is nonpolar. There is no dipole. Methane is, it has polar bonds, but they're balanced. They're offsetting to each other because of the shape. The shape has radial symmetry. So the molecule itself, well, it's all positive on the outside and there's in the center of the molecule, it's a little negative. So the molecule acts like a big positive poof. Whereas the sulfur dichloride has a positive side and a negative side. The sulfur dichlorides are gonna be much more attracted together than the methanes are gonna be. All right, so let's go forward and see what we got going on here. So look what I got. I went to all that trouble of, of drawing them and they're already there. now. Molecular polarity is based on the shape. If the molecule has radial symmetry, it's going to be physically balanced and it's going to be nonpolar. The bonds can be polar or not, but if it has radial symmetry, it means it's the same on both sides. The balance or the symmetry that we need to measure is called radial symmetry. There are other symmetries, but they don't matter in chemistry. Now, SCL2. SCL2 is not radial symmetry because I showed you the two dots on the top and when we cut it in half, that makes it so that it's not going to have radial symmetry. But methane, methane which has polar bonds, does have radial symmetry. Now let's look at 117, this is important. Radial symmetry is gonna offset the polarity and the molecule is nonpolar. SCL2 is a liquid at room temperature, but methane is a gas. How come? Well, the sulfur dichlorides have a lot stronger intermolecular attraction called a dipole attraction. Dipole attraction is when the molecules themselves are positive and negative sided and they're attracted together. So at room temperature, SCL2 has a lot of intermolecular attraction to the point where it turns to a liquid, whereas methane all positive on the outside in a non-polar molecule, there's almost no, well, not no attraction, right? There's electron dispersion, but there's not enough attraction to turn it into a, into a liquid.
right? Radial symmetry, this is all right there. Radial symmetry makes the difference. So if you have polar bonds in a polar molecule, you will have dipole attraction. Dipole attraction is stronger than electron dispersion because it's almost a constant positive negative side to the bond, which makes the molecules positive and negative as well. So look at these dots. Each SCL molecule has red dots indicating the dipole attraction. The chlorines, the chloride side, are attracted to the S's, sulfur, which are positive, and all the positive S's are attracted to other chlorides. And this near constant dipole means these molecules are attracted together almost all the time. And that, even though it's not too strong, is enough to make it a liquid at room temperature, whereas if you have methane, there's no attraction. The green carbons are negative, but they're buried inside these four hydrogens in this kind of a triangular pyramid shape. The whole outside of the molecule is positive. So when molecules of methane come near each other, the positive outside of one molecule and the positive outside of the other, there's like no real attraction. There's no dipole. There is a little movement of electrons. The electrons move around and there'll be a little electro, electron dispersion attraction, but hardly anything. It's not zero attraction because everything has electron dispersion. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about here is hydrogen bonding. Now, when I was in high school, there was no such thing as hydrogen bonding. We had dipole attraction, and you could measure how strong that dipole attraction was approximately by looking at the bond polarity. The more polar the bond, the stronger the dipole. So we used to have weak dipole, like sulfur dichloride, the difference between them, sulfur and chlorine, is, is a 0.6 difference, so that's polar. But with water, H2O, the difference between oxygen and hydrogen is a 1.2 difference, that's really polar. So we used to say when I was in high school, sulfur dichloride has got dipole attraction, weak dipole attraction, but water has strong dipole attraction. Unfortunately, New York State says, no, we're gonna do something different now with these kids. We still have dipole attraction, but if there are hydrogen atoms in the bond, because hydrogen has such a low electronegativity value, it makes the dipole so much stronger, we're gonna call it something different. We're gonna call it hydrogen bonding. But really, hydrogen bonding is like super duper dipole. It's the same exact thing, except there's hydrogen present. When hydrogen bonds to oxygen, or hydrogen bonds to fluorine, or hydrogen bonds to, to anything really, there's a much greater difference in electronegativity. Those bonds are more polar than other polar bonds. Polar bonds create dipole attraction. New York State says if the polar bond has hydrogen in it, we're gonna call that hydrogen bonding. Okay, so we gotta have polar bonds. So look at this. SCL2 is a 0.6, water has a point as a 1.2 difference. It's a huge difference. Super duper polar. So that makes the water molecules stick together way stronger than the SCL2. Now, honestly. What causes this? It, polar bonds and polar molecules. Water has a greater bond polarity, so its molecule is more polar than sulfur dichloride. So we got dipole and dipole. We got weak dipole, strong dipole. But unfortunately, New York State says no. We have dipole attraction, but if we have dipole with hydrogen, we call it hydrogen bonding, just to drive teenagers crazy. Super duper dipole. So we talked about this already. The difference in these values is a 0.6 difference for sulfur dichloride or a 1.2 difference for the water. Super duper dipole is going to be called hydrogen bonding. All right, I think we're getting close. Now, I ask you to draw these six molecules. They're a bit like soldiers here. They're not too random, but we're going to draw some hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonding will be dots or dashes something different. Those lines are all single polar covalent bonds. We need to draw some dots or dashes to indicate the hydrogen bonding. And that's what this looks like. The dots, the red dot dashes from hydrogen to oxygen, from oxygen to hydrogen between the molecules. This is the strongest of the three intermolecular attractions and it's called hydrogen bonding, AKA super duper dipole. 
super duper dipole. All right, this is just for fun. Give an example, it contains these kinds of bonds. We'll go through this, for example, um, ionic. Oh, we got them all at once. Ionic bonds, we have sodium chloride, calcium oxide, potassium bromide, magnesium oxide. We got a metal and a non-metal that bond together by forming ions. Single nonpolar covalent bonds, that means two or more nonmetals that bond together that have the same electronegativity value. Then we have single polar covalent bonds. This is when we have one pair of electrons being shared, but they have different electronegativity values. HCl, HF, HBr, HI. Those are all single polar covalent bonds, and they're different than the single nonpolar covalent bonds because they're polar. Now, a double nonpolar covalent bond, that would be oxygen. Oxygen shares two pairs of electrons. There's six electrons valence in each. They both borrow and share two electrons, so they call that a double bond. And because it's two atoms with the same electronegativity, 3.4 and 3.4, it's a double nonpolar bond. Now, when carbon dioxide bonds, it actually has carbon in the center making a double bond to an oxygen on the left and an oxygen on the right. So the carbon dioxide molecule actually has two double bonds. And because oxygen and carbon have different electronegativity values, they're both double and they're both polar. So we call them double polar covalent. Triple nonpolar covalent, N2, each nitrogen atom has five valence electrons. So each needs to get three from the other. The only way to do that is to make what's called a triple bond, and it's actually nonpolar because both nitrogens have the same electronegativity value. So there's no difference in electronegativity. N2 is a triple nonpolar covalent. Now in a triple polar covalent, this is, this is an odd molecule that you're not gonna be really aware of, but nitrogen can bond to carbon and hydrogen. Carbon in the middle makes a triple bond to nitrogen and a single bond to hydrogen. And the bond between N and C, between nitrogen and carbon, is going to be triple polar covalent. Now, the coordinate covalent, this is an oddball. This is when carbon and oxygen bond in a one-to-one -one ratio. They make a double polar covalent, normal. But that doesn't get carbon an octet. The only way carbon gets an octet, the only way it's going to work, is to somehow imagine that oxygen will kind of loan two extra electrons into the middle so that even though they're not sharing them between each other, oxygen just shares them with the molecule. So we call the coordinate covalent bond that extra bond that carbon and oxygen has in carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide starts with a double polar covalent bond. They, carbon and oxygen share two pairs of electrons unevenly, and then oxygen just lends two more electrons in to make that work. That's our only example. You gotta remember that one. Now, Ozone. I grew up in Ozone Park. It's in Queens. It's kind of like being from Vessel in Broome County. Ozone Park is a weird name. Nobody knows why it's called that. There's not any more ozone there than anywhere else. But it was a weird. That's where I grew up. Ozone Park. Don't get this one wrong. I take it very serious. Personal. Resonating bond. Bonds that go back and forth, back and forth. They're hybrid. They're not normal. You can draw them. You got to draw them like two pictures and say first like this, then like that, then like this, then like that, back and forth, back and forth. It resonates back and forth. Sometimes you can have multiple different kinds of bonds in a compound. You can have ionic and covalent at the same time. Look at this stuff. This is that blue stuff that we used beginning of the year. Copper, Roman numeral two sulfate, pentahydrate. The copper ion bonds to the sulfate anion with an ionic bond. The sulfur and the oxygen make polar covalent bonds. The water has polar covalent bonds. And then the water molecules have that dot that loose bond from the water that sticks to the copper Roman number two sulfate is called hydrogen bonding. So here we got ionic covalent and hydrogen bonding all in the same one. Sometimes you break the rules. PCL5 will break the rules. PCL5 will cause a molecule like phosphorus with five chlorines. Phosphorus ends up with 10, 10 electrons instead of eight. It has too many electrons, but it exists and somehow it's able to jam it in there and it works. And then finally, some, sometimes molecules will break the octet rule or ionic compounds will break the octet rule because they're too small. H2, each H atom shares one electron. They end up with two shared electrons in the first orbital. That's not eight, that's two. That's because it's too small to have eight, but it's still got full orbitals. That's really the more important thing. Lithium fluoride, 
lithium becomes a positive one ion and fluorine becomes a negative one. Fluorine ends up following the octet rule, but lithium ends up with just two electrons in the first orbital and then empty. Uh, it's too small to follow the octet rule. You should have good examples in your head. And these are good examples. And that's it. We're going to stop right here. Isn't this fun?